Hi everybody and welcome back to Language and Communication with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. And today is our final uh, proper lecture, if you like. I'm going to be lecturing today on Adele Mercier's paper, which is a response to uh, Dawkins and Dummett and their use of the gender-neutral man. That is the pronoun man, not referring to men, but to humanity. The thing I warned you against doing in the essay assignment during our live lecture, for example. The title of this lecture is uh, Masculine Language as Contingently a Priori. I'll explain what that means as the lecture unfolds, but I just want to say, before I get started, thank you all so much for bearing with me while I get this final lecture done and completed. I know class has officially ended, and I did not want to go past the um, official end dates of the course. That said, this material, you know, you're not being quizzed on it. Uh, there is no uh, additional quiz to quiz you on this material. So you'll be using this material only to answer one of the final exam questions, if indeed you choose one of the questions where Mercier's work features as a source that you'll need to cite. So apologies, but even though I'm a little bit late, you should still be okay. So if not, if you have any questions or concerns, though, of course, as always, let me know. So the plan for today is to kind of walk through some of the main ideas in Mercier's paper. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the motivations behind uh, Mercier's argument against the use of uh, the gender-neutral man. Um, and we'll also be looking a bit at the context in which this occurs. Um, it's kind of uh, contextualized in terms of uh, responding to Dawkins and uh, Dummett uh, at the beginning of Mercier's paper. In any case, we'll get into that. As we go, of course, I'll also be refreshing some of our terminology, the relevant terminology that we'll need to draw from in order to make sense of Mercier's argument. The reason why she's arguing uh, what she is is because she sees the gender-neutral use of man as a contingent a priori, um, which is perverse, she says. Contingent a priori, we're going to talk about what that means as we proceed, but <coughs> basically, contingent truths um, are, are, are things that depend on certain things being the case, and a priori truths are truths that can be known deductively, independent of sense experience. So if we have a contingent a priori, that's kind of a red flag for Mercier, because we shouldn't be able to have those things. We shouldn't have things that we can know deductively, independent of sense experience, that we come to know just because things are the case, and, you know, they might have been, uh, things might have been different, right? So we'll get into, we'll come back to Kripke a little bit here, actually, but I'll explain what I mean in detail by contingent a priori as the lecture proceeds. We're not going to be able to take a super detailed look at every single one of the arguments that Mercier offers in her paper, but we're going to try to cash them out in terms of three kinds of arguments. And those are arguments from clarity, uh, in, arguments from clarity and communication, that is, arguments from logic, and arguments from justice. So we'll be taking a look at each type of argument that Mercier argues in her paper. These are, of course, arguments against maintaining the gender-neutral use of man. Uh, just want to reiterate that. And I might do a little bit of reflection toward the end on uh, political correctness and the backlash against political correctness. We will see what strikes me uh, as I lecture. And, of course, if, if anything strikes you about some of the implications of what Mercier is talking about here, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments section, or perhaps on Discord, or see you learn. All right, so that's the plan for today, so let's get into it. So before we get too far into things, I'm going to take a look at slides three and four here, where we're going to talk a bit about language and social reality, and whether one is a mirror of the other. So recall, if you will, Fauci and colleagues' article, where they found that non-agentive languages, so 
when uh, actions are described non-agentively, like the cup broke rather than he broke the cup. When we use non-agentive languages, that act or non-agentive language, that diminishes um, people's memories of the individuals involved in the actions in question. Now, of course, diminished memory uh, of the uh, people involved in those actions um, and discussion, or whether we discuss these individuals as agents or not, influences um, how we uh, how we regard them in terms of whether their actions are praiseworthy or blameworthy, um, and this can in turn have uh, implications for whether we think those individuals are deserving of punishment or not. So all of this is to say that um, differences in language seem to entail differences uh, in terms of how we evaluate people being responsible for certain events. Now it's important to mention that all kinds of different conventions can have uh, deleterious effects. Even conventions that are perhaps uh, uh, apparently benign or well-intentioned. So when we're talking conventions here, we're not limiting, limiting ourselves just to linguistic conventions, although we are focusing on linguistic conventions in this class. I guess I'm just mentioning this so that you're aware that it, it, it's not necessarily language itself that um, works, uh, works this way. Uh, that, that influences the way we think of others and the way we think of the world. It may not just be the language itself, but perhaps also the language's interaction with existing social practices or existing attitudes within a certain community of speakers. And this could create or help to create um, a, a harmful role for language. Mercier herself points out that some conventions, while they seem innocent in themselves, like, for example, the gender-neutral man, um, they seem innocent in themselves, but they may, in fact, turn out to be, uh, quote, recipe for moral disaster. And, of course, Mercier gets into this with her example of language being an unwitting vehicle of colorism, which you can read about in her paper. Now, basically, what Mercier is, going, is saying here uh, in her paper, just to bring it away from Fauci et al.'s back to Mercier's paper, uh, is that language is kind of like a mirror for uh, social reality, and social reality can also be a mirror for language. It mirrors linguistic practices. This relationship of uh, our linguistic practices and conventions um, and our social reality and the way that our practices and our view of reality mirror one another can actually reinforce and perpetuate unjust states of affairs. So as you may have guessed later on when we're going to talk about Mercier's arguments from justice, what we're really talking about here is an argument from social justice. Now, as I just mentioned, um, Mercier's main point is that... Uh, you know, language being able to reinforce and perpetuate unjust states of affairs is true of a particular and frankly outdated linguistic convention, and that is the gender-neutral masculine. You know, the use of the word man to refer to all humans or to refer to individual men and women. She also wants to argue, though, uh, that continued use and endorsement of this particular linguistic convention is motivated by certain social practice and attitudes that are sort of there in the background already. So you can see in this way, it's not just language influencing uh, social practices and our view of social reality, but our practices and our views of reality influencing the way we speak. So she's making this, uh, this claim that uh, language and social, social reality uh, kind of mutually reinforce one another. And that's why, for Mercier, this is really uh, not just an issue about language, but also an issue about social justice. So the use of man, the gender-neutral man, as well as the use of male pronouns, um, is not neutral. That's something that Mercier is going to argue in this paper. They're not neutral linguistically, and they're not neutral uh, in terms of value, either. Anyway, before I get too deep into this stuff, maybe we should talk a little bit about um, some of the aforementioned social justice concerns of Mercier. What is politically concerning here 
about the use of the neutral masculine. That is about using man to refer to humanity. Let's take a look. So let's talk a little bit about the issue surrounding justice and linguistic conventions, uh, because there are some pretty good prima facie justifications for pursuing this that Mercier is taking up. I mean, we've already seen, uh, again, recall Fauci's paper, or recall our guest lecture as well from Joanne Farrell, that how we speak can influence the way we think and act and on different levels at that. In particular, Mercier is arguing that cultural or social conventions, for example, regarding uh, which individuals we greet and how we greet them, even something, is, uh, even something as seemingly innocuous as that, can create what she calls moral disasters. So, for example, seemingly innocent uh, linguistic or social practices might be, quote, unwitting vehicles, unquote, of discriminatory attitudes and oppressive states of affairs. To illustrate this, she kind of offers a bit of a thought experiment. Uh, it's like a colorism thought experiment, where benign greeting conventions combine with discriminatory attitudes or practices that are present within a certain society, reinforce and perpetuate that discrimination. You can find an example of this in Mercier's paper on page 242. I'm just going to read it verbatim, starting 242 and continuing on to page 243. So, here we go. Suppose there existed in a society of red and blue people the following convention about how to greet people at a dinner party. Since it is cumbersome upon arriving to have to shake everyone's hand, the convention has it that you shake the hand of the person closest to you when you enter the room. Others are thereby also greeted and are expected to feel as though they have been included in the greeting. All right, so that's our greeting convention. Now, for no reason connected with this convention, but for reasons connected with colorism, a form of discrimination practiced by the red people against the blue people, it's customary for blue people to be seated far from the door. Perhaps they are thought unable to handle drafts, Mercier notes in parentheses. To continue, it just so happens that their hands will seldom be shaken when they are in mixed company. But that's not the fault of the convention, the greeting convention, that is. The convention is colorblind, and Mercier gives the convention here. For any arbitrary X, Shake the hand of X if and only if X is the person closest to you when you enter the door. So that's the benign greeting convention that's going on in this uh, uh, society of red and blue people here. Now to continue on to page 243. Now, the same blue people whose hands are seldom shaken at parties know that in their colorist society there are nasty people who would not shake their hands even if they were seated by the door or who would do so only reluctantly. They also know that their red friends know this and purport to be aggrieved by it. It seems to me clear that, given the colorist context in which it holds, such a convention is a recipe for moral disaster. The blue people, whose hands seldom, if ever, get shaken, are likely to start wondering about any person not shaking their hand, whether or not had they been seated by the door, such a person would have shaken their hand. And worse, the people who don't, or who only reluctantly, shake blue hands are likely to wonder the same thing about the same people and to impute their own motives to them, as humans are wont to do, in a self-justificatory way. This is not to mention the psychological effects that the negative stimulus the absence or infrequency of perceptions of blue hands and red is likely to have on young children, red and blue. In this way, a perfectly innocent convention is co-opted to serve the paranoia of colorism's victims and the self-validation of its perpetrators. Thus does it become an unwitting vehicle of colorism. So, that's the example, and it's pretty easy to see how this example could apply in the real world as well. So for example, even if the gender-neutral masculine language that we're talking about here 
is entirely innocent in the way that uh, Dummett and Dawkins think, uh, at, where they are quoted in this paper by Mercier, for example, cultural context will nonetheless guarantee that the use of the gender-neutral man will be unavoidably unjust or harmful in some way because of the context, not because of the convention. So an innocent convention in a context where there are also perhaps sexist or misogynist attitudes, whether they are systemic or personal or whatever, um, can unavoidably lead to uh, harm or injustice. And this is the kind of social justice issue as it relates to language use that Mercier is pursuing in this paper. Now, Mercier's paper is entitled A Perverse Case of the Contingent A Priori. So I want to go over a review of a prioricity and contingency before we really get into the meat and potatoes of the article. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, a priori knowledge is knowledge that uh, you can have without experience. So if we know an a priori truth, we know it before we've gathered any evidence. Indeed, we don't need to gather any evidence to know an a priori truth, because a priori truths are just that kind of thing that we know prior to experience, thus a priori. So really what you require in order to know an a priori truth is really just an understanding of the resources of the language that you're speaking. For example, uh, and this is the classic example of uh, an a priori truth, would be something like all bachelors are unmarried, right? You can know that a bachelor is an unmarried man because in English, the word bachelor refers to an unmarried man. So if I say John is a bachelor, you know a priori he is unmarried, because that's just what a bachelor is. What a prioricity and a posteriority are all about really is, uh, you know, uh, the nature of knowledge. These concepts concern the nature of knowledge and where knowledge is obtained from. So that's a prioricity, is knowledge that we can have uh, independently of or prior to experience. Now that, uh, that covers a prioricity from slide six, but we want to talk about contingency as well. Contingency and necessity, more specifically. And this can be found on slide seven, and as we're talking our way through this, you'll probably want to th uh, think back to the work of Saul Kripke, who was interested in modal logic and necessity and possibility. You remember his, uh, his, his idea that names are rigid, rigid designators? They refer to the same individual in all possible worlds or all possible states of affairs. We're dealing with something similar here. So again, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, contingent facts are facts that could have been false had things been different. For example, you might not have enrolled at Carleton University. Perhaps you uh, enrolled in the University of Ottawa in another possible world. Perhaps Facebook was never invented in another possible world. Perhaps MySpace continued to be popular, and today we'd all still be on MySpace. Perhaps the English language would have developed differently. Uh, we, we talk a lot about some old root words from Latin and English in this paper. That is, Mercier talks about them, you know, how in Saxon, or Old English, there was a word for man that was man, that referred to humans, and then there was a word where, which referred to men, and uh, so where man was a, was a man, and woman was a woman, right? So language has changed, and it's possible that, I don't know, maybe, um, maybe the Normans never conquered England in another world, and our language uh, didn't have so much influence from Old French, um, and maybe English would sound a lot more like Dutch or something if, if that had never happened. So that's possible in another possible world. Uh, so contingent facts are facts that we can know given how things are, but we, we couldn't know them because things might be different in another world, another possible world, where we couldn't know those facts if things were different. But when we're talking about those different worlds themselves, we're moving from the epistemic more into the metaphysical. So contingency is opposed to necessity. 
Uh, necessary facts are necessarily true, and contingent facts, of course, are not, because they are contingent. So, for example, the actual substance gold, uh, not the word gold, the substance gold, will have the same chemical composition in whatever world we're looking at, whether we're looking at, for example, our world, or perhaps some variant of a twin Earth somewhere, where gold is still gold, atomically and chemically speaking. Or in another possible world where perhaps uh, you speak a different kind of English and you're on MySpace instead of Facebook and you go to the University of Ottawa, you would still have your same genetic code. Your DNA might be the same. So you'd be a different person in one sense, but not in the genetic sense. So uh, that's, uh, that's all to illustrate the difference between contingency and necessity. Here's where we really start getting into the metaphysics. Uh, contingency and necessity are uh, what we call modalities. And this is why what Kripke helped develop uh, has come to be known as modal logic, because it deals with what is necessary or what is possible. So modalities, uh, a modality is a metaphysical concept. Modalities in particular are metaphysical concepts that uh, concern the structure of reality. So that's why I said, now we're getting really metaphysical. Uh, you may remember from the reading we did, uh, Naming and Necessity, by Kripke, that he distinguishes between uh, necessity and contingency, which is metaphysical, and between a priori and a posteriori, which are epistemological. So, um, Kripke points out that oftentimes the metaphysical and epistemological stuff gets mixed up by certain philosophers, right? Um, necessity gets confused with a prioricity a lot of the times, the metaphysical and the epistemological. Contingency gets confused with a posterioricity sometimes by philosophers. And again, that's something that Kripke is careful to avoid. So Kripke distinguishes uh, between necessity and contingency on the one hand as metaphysical concepts and a prioricity and a posterioricity on the other hand as epistemic concepts. Of course, he thinks many thinkers wrongly conflate these two, um, and they wrongly presume further that necessary truths are known a priori, where all contingent truths are discovered a posteriori. Of course, Kripke thought this was wrong. He didn't think this was the case. So, we've recapped these ideas of necessity and contingency and a prioricity and a posteriority. Um, so, what is contingent a priori? Well, remember, Kripke says that philosophers uh, kind of mix up, or he accuses a lot of philosophers of equivocating between um, a priori knowledge and necessary truth, on the one hand, and uh, contingent truth and a posteriori knowledge, on the other hand. He thinks that this way of doing it is wrong, and it allows for the possibility of something called a contingent a priori truth on Kripke's view. Now, on slide 9, we read that some philosophers, in particular Michael Dummett, who is one of the thinkers that Mercier is responding to, reject the plausibility of these contingent a priori truths. It's kind of easy to see why. On a first pass, the idea of a contingent a priori truth sounds a little funny. A contingent a priori truth would be a truth that is only contingently true. In other words, it just happens to be true in this world or in, in, in this particular context, and yet is also knowable without experience of the world. And for Dummett, this is all a little bit incoherent. You might be wondering, following this quote from page 222 of Mercier's paper, how could something be contingent, and therefore possibly otherwise, were the world other than it is, yet known to be the case without experience of the world as it actually is? Yeah, when you put it that way, contingent a priori truths uh, sound like kind of a weird idea. Alright, so now that I've laid all of that stuff out, we can finally really get to the main um, ideas in the paper, which is... Uh, of course, Mercier's reply to uh, Richard Dawkins and Michael Dummett on the, uh, in terms of their discussion of the gender-neutral man. 
Now, I'm going to try not to uh, use uh, the words sex and gender interchangeably here, because these are really two different things that uh, often are, uh, I guess, in the way Kripke thought that a priori and necessary truths are often treated the same. Sex and gender are often treated the same. So, of course, uh, you know, sex rever uh, in, in most circles, sex refers to biological characteristics. This could be uh, chromosomes or uh, genitalia or whatever, right? And I realize this is not a perfect uh, way to cash this out. But uh, this is, you know, just kind of, I'm painting with broad strokes here. We can think of sex as something that's a bit more biological. Gender is uh, about one's inner experience. Uh, it's what you identify as. So, you know, male and female, we could think of in terms of sex. Man and woman, we think of in, in, in terms of gender. And of course, there are many, many different theories of gender and many, many theories about the biology of sex that we don't have to get into today. I just want to, to keep in mind that I'm, I'm trying to keep these separate. Now, uh, Dawkins and Dummett, uh, among other thinkers, but Dawkins and Dummett in this paper, both claim that masculine language, like, for example, the gender-neutral man and male pronouns, have two different kinds of uses and two different kinds of meanings. One is neutral, right, as I've already mentioned. So uh, in, in the neutral sense, the neutral, non-gendered man refers to women and men. The other gendered use applies only to men. So Dawkins states at one point where he's quoted in this paper that just because he uses the male pronoun, it doesn't mean that he doesn't mean what he says to apply to women because he is using, he claims, the gender neutral man, you know, to refer to humans. Mercier, all, by the way, in this paper proposes alternatively to using the gender neutral man, we just use humans or humanity. So Dawkins draws this analogy between what he's doing with uh, the non-gendered and, uh, you know, the gender neutral man and the uh, gendered language in French. This is a bit different. Uh, it's not gender in the sense that I was talking about before. This is gendered in the sense that certain, um, you know, for example, noun forms are masculine and, and feminine they have different forms in the Romance languages, like French, Italian, and Spanish. This, of course, is not the case in English. We don't have uh, gender in the English language in this way. But Dawkins says, you know, uh, just because, uh, you know, just because I'm using the word man, I don't mean to exclude women any more than, you know, a French speaker would think that a table is uh, masculine or feminine. I actually don't speak very much French, so I don't know if uh, tables are masculine or feminine in French. Now, uh, sure, Dawkins says this, uh, I don't mean to use man in a uh, gendered sense to refer only to men, but Mercier says, hang on, Richard Dawkins, you're forgetting about this distinction between semantic gender and grammatical gender here. Uh, so let's try and take a look at that, uh, semantic and grammatical gender. Let's try to parse that out and uh, cash that out by using some examples, which you can find on slide 11. So here are some quotes where we can take a look at the difference between semantic gender and grammatical gender. Here's one quote. Man is the measure of all things. Ah, oh, that's an old quote. It uses man in the neutral sense. Uh, it means man like humans. Uh, humans are the measure of all things. This is an old sophist uh, phrase, by the way. The sophists were like ancient Greek um, relativists, wise guys, almost kind of like lawyers, making the weaker argument the stronger. Here's another example. I saw the man who saved your baby. Well, that uses man in a gendered sense. So, I saw the man who saved your baby. Well, you saw a man who saved your baby. Uh, a person who is male and who identifies as a man saved a baby, so that's a gendered use of the word man. That man saved your baby. Something like everyone is entitled to his opinion is supposed to be using his in the neutral sense. This statement, uh, were Dawkins or Dummett to utter it, would argue that 
He's not using his to refer only to men, but to everyone, to men and women, and those that lie in between. Here's another example. Mr. Dressup was his favorite. Well, that uses his in the gendered sense, once again. So in this case, his favorite, uh, Mr. Dressup uh, must have been his favorite television show. Uh, you guys remember Mr. Dressup, right? Here we're obviously talking about, you know, perhaps a young boy whose favorite television show is Mr. Dress Up. So this is uh, in the gendered sense, once again. All right, so on to slide 12, where we really get into a close look at this perverse case of the contingent a priori that is the gender-neutral man. So here Mercier is arguing, contra Michael Dummett, that masculine language really does inform the reader or listener a priori of the person's sex or gender. So when we use the gender-neutral man, we're not really using it gender-neutrally. We might intend to, but what we're actually doing is letting the reader know a priori that we are talking about the person's sex or gender. We are talking about that person as a man. Now, uh, the, the arguments that Mercier offers here are directed at, against both the use of man and the worst of the, and against the use of masculine pronouns in the neutral sense. So not just using man to refer to humanity, but to use he to refer to men and women. So Mercier is saying here that words like man and he can't be correctly or appropriately used in a gender neutral way because they inform the reader a priori of the gender of uh, the person who you're talking about. The person or people you're talking about, I should say. Basically, what Mercier is arguing here is that masculine language, you know, using uh, the gender-neutral man in the way that Richard Dawkins and Michael Dummett do, turns a contingent fact, you know, the male gender or the male sex of the individual or people that you're talking about with your linguistic utterances, into a priori knowledge. Notice where the problem is starting to appear here? Basically, uh, you know, this is co co conventional implicature here. You know, we're, the gender neutral use of man informs the speaker's audience, a priori, using the resources of language, of a contingent fact, which is the male sex or gender of the referent. And you can read about this in Mercier's paper on page 237. So why is this perverse? Well, it's perverse in, in at least the sense that Dummett, as I mentioned a moment ago, argued against Kripke's views on reference and morality. Dummett thought that uh, Kripke's views here implied the existence of contingent a priori truths. And Dummett uh, thinks that that's uh, kind of weird, right? But here's Dummett argues Mercier, uh, doing this exact thing with his views on uh, the gender-neutral man, turning uh, something contingent into contingent a priori knowledge. That is contingent a priori knowledge of the gender of, you know, the referent of man or mankind or men or his. So basically, Mercier is saying that Dummett has uh, committed the very thing he uh, criticized Kripke of doing in his use of the gender-neutral man and the gender-neutral male pronouns. Now, who is this argument for? Well, this, is, uh, this argument is really directed toward people who uh, think that there has been some history of sexism. Arguably, I think all of you would agree that there is a history of sexism in the West, that we can identify, and indeed, uh, histories of sexism around the world in various cultures as well. Um, but in any case, I'm certainly not going to argue that there is still not sexism, and there are certainly people who are not convinced that our language has a role in sexism. And this argument is for those people, for those people who acknowledge that there is sexism or that there has been sexism, but who deny that language plays a role in it and that the gender-neutral use of man or male pronouns is innocuous in this way. Now, Dummett is also claiming that criticism of the gender-neutral use of man and male pronouns is ideologically motivated. 
So Dummett and other, I guess we could call them linguistic conservatives or conservativists who want to preserve the gender-neutral man, think that arguments against doing so are motivated perhaps by uh, political ideology, perhaps some tenet of uh, some branch of feminism, for example. And Dummett, of course, argues further that the gender-neutral gender uh, masculine terms used to work just fine in English. So what's the problem? It's, it's, he seems to be suggesting that it's these feminists who don't understand that the gender-neutral man refers to men and women, and if they just understood that, there wouldn't be a problem. So, you know, as I kind of gestured at a moment ago, in Old English there was a gender-neutral man, and it was unambiguously gender-neutral. The Saxon, or Anglo-Saxon word man, M-A-N-N, -N, referred to human beings. Um, it's the same thing in Latin, you know, homo in Latin refers to human being, but vir refers to man. In Ancient Greek, um, Anthropos refers to the human being, but andros and gynos refer to men and women specifically. In Saxon, where we have man for men and woman, uh, we have where for man and woman for woman. Where is also the root of some words you may still be familiar with, like werewolf, a man wolf, a wolf who's a man, or uh, weregild, uh, the money that uh, uh, someone might have to pay someone else for killing another man. Uh, say, back in the day, I'm some lord and I, I kill some guy uh, for doing something wrong. I've got to pay Weirgild, man price, human pr like man price to his family uh, because I've killed this person who would be bringing in, uh, you know, money and uh, growing food and crops and whatnot. Now, uh, just limiting ourselves to these old English examples, you know, historically the word man was only gender neutral. Where was used for male humans, uh, but where eventually fell out of favor in the English language, you know, because the English language has gone through many, 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 many changes over the years. English, of course, has changed uh, more than a lot of other languages over the years. I mean, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes came from uh, modern-day northern Germany and Jutland, you know, around where Denmark is, over to the British Isles after, uh, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Of course, when they got there, they were speaking Anglo-Saxon, but this mixed a little bit with the Celtic languages that were being spoken. Um, and, of course, uh, Latin and Greek uh, loan words uh, eventually made it into English, along with a lot of French vocabulary uh, because of the Norman Conquest, when William the Conqueror conquered England. Um, <coughs> of course, you also have the, uh, the Vikings. Uh, Old Norse, although it used to be quite close to Old English, had changed a bit, and when Norse uh, people came to the British Isles, their language also affected English. And then, of course, later, the Norman conquests, lots of loan words from Latin and French, and uh, English is this kind of weird hodgepodge where so many words have changed, and that's why we don't really have the gender-neutral man, M-A-N-N, -N, that the Anglo-Saxons had anymore. So for Mercier, this historical fact about the English language negates Dummett's claim about the uniquely ideological grounds that are involved uh, to reject the use of masculine language. It's kind of, I guess, a, a, a much more uh, detailed and precise way of saying what I said earlier, you know, uh, don't, earlier in the live lecture in regards to your papers, don't use man or mankind because it's just not correct anymore. We used to be able to use man, M-A-N-N, -N, that way hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but we don't really do that anymore. We've kind of lost that word. So this past semantic shift of the word man means for Mercier that we can't use man any longer um, as a translation uh, for like words like human being or person. 
Uh, in other words, we can't use man in this gender-neutral way anymore because of the semantic changes that have happened in the English language over hundreds and hundreds of years. So what Dummett and others are really doing here is, um, we'll call them conservative prescriptivists following Mercier. What they want to do is kind of uh, resist disambiguation in English at the cost of accuracy and clarity, right? They want to use man in a gender-neutral way, uh, but, but that comes at the expense of accuracy and clarity, clarity, which you can see in the examples, many, many examples that Mercier gives where she substitutes different words, you know, the gender-neutral man for woman, for person, and so on and so forth. It kind of shows why this doesn't really work for Dummett. Of course, she also offers a bunch of arguments supporting her claim, and we can divide them up into three categories for the purposes of our overview. All of these arguments uh, kind of respond to gender-neutral uh, supporters, gender-neutral use of supporters of the word man, so that includes these conservative prescriptivists I just mentioned. Now, my coverage here of this is not going to be exhaustive because she covers so much, but I'll try to give as good an overview as I can. All right, so the first sort of argument we're going to look at is the uh, argument from clarity. Now here Mercier points out that some words sound exactly the same, but they clearly refer to different things, and they don't hinder clear expression or communication. So a good example of this is the word bank, right? Bank can refer to a financial institution, but bank can also refer to, uh, you know, the edge of a river, a river bank. Now, in English, we can continually use this word bank with these two different meanings, uh, use them for two different purposes in our language, um, despite the ambiguity. We can, we can successfully do that. Why can't we do that for man? You know, man in terms of a gender-neutral man, or man the gendered man, like a man? Well, the reason why we can't, as we're about to find out, has to do with the vagueness and confusion that's res that results when we use masculine language in a gender-neutral way. Mercier is trying to show us here that this just doesn't work. This sort of usage of the gender-neutral man is bound to result in unclear communication, unclear expressions, so on and so forth. So if man, you know, uh, is really neutral in the way bank is neutral, uh, we should be able uh, to use it. It should be able to function in a similar way to the way bank functions, you know, uh, a river bank or a bank is in a financial institution. It should be able to function like this without confusion in two different ways. In what sense should a word like this be able to function without confusion? Well, well, it should work when the two uses have enough semantic distance between them. The, ambigu the ambiguity in such a case isn't so taxing or ridiculous uh, so that we're not confused, right? For example, if I said to you, the bank I went to was not near a bank, you can understand that I'm talking about two different things there. You'd probably guess that the river bank I went to is not near a financial institution. Or perhaps the other way around, the financial institution that I went to was not near a, uh, a river bank. If the semantic distance, if what these words refer to is great enough, the usage of the same word in these two different ways can survive because it, it doesn't create ambiguity. However, because of the semantic proximity of the two uses of man, that is for uh, male persons versus just persons, just humans, the semantic proximity of those is not, uh, it's too close. Basically, man isn't equipped for this dual function in the same way that bank is, because uh, there isn't enough semantic distance between the two uses of the word, the gender-neutral use and the gendered use. Basically, the semantic proximity of the gender-neutral and gender-specific versions of man 
uh, make its ambiguity somewhat intolerable in linguistic practice. So, for example, uh, consider a sentence like, the man who discovered fire was not a man, or the best man for the job is Mary. I mean, those just sound weird and unclear. Uh, they, use, they use man in these two different ways, and you can see how they're unclear in a way that the bank I went to was not near a bank is not unclear. I mean, all of those sentences are unclear, but the sentences that use the gender-neutral and gender-specific man are way more unclear than the one that uses the two different uh, meanings of the word bank. So if two reference for a particular term, like man, are too semantically close, if their per semantic proximity is not great enough, the ambiguity that results from their use can't be tolerated, and one use of the term needs to go away. None, it must fall out of use if we're going to use our language and not be ambiguous and unclear all the time. And this can apply to less loaded terms as well. I mean, you can compare our earlier example of the two uses of the word bank with two uses of the word presently. Now, in the United Kingdom, the word presently means in a little while which is importantly different, although not terribly different, but importantly different from what the American version of presently, and I would argue also the Canadian version of, pre uh, of, of presently means, which is, of course, right now, immediately. Just imagine uh, the ambiguity of these two uses of the word presently in a sentence like, the ambulance will be called presently. Well, is the ambulance being called right now, or is it being called in a little while? Because if it's being called in a little while, I might be dead by the time it gets here. So in the ambulance case, uh, the uses of presently are just too similar. So uh, no one is arguing that we try and save the United Kingdom of version of presently in American vernacular English. That would just create intolerable ambiguity. And in the case of uh, the gender-neutral and gender-specific man, respectively, one use is actually subsuming the other. The gender-specific use is subserving the gender-neutral use such that there aren't really these independent meanings anymore. Why should we be concerned with this? Well, I'm sure it's probably easier to grasp for the women in the class uh, than it is for the men, or perhaps some of the men. But if I put my uh, opposite gender perspective hat on, I can imagine that the use of the word man, if I were a woman, would raise the question for me whether I am included. You know, for men, if, you know, it, it's, it's less ambiguous, right? Um, if, if the gender neutral and gender specific uh, uses of the word man create ambiguity, well, they don't create much ambiguity for men because it's always trivial, regardless of whether the word is being used gender neutrally or gender specifically, that men are included. But this ambiguity raises the question for women of whether they are included as reference when we use the words like man or is. So, um, masculine language in, uh, in a, in, in, in a gender-neutral usage doesn't allow for us to use clear and well-formed sentences in our uh, linguistic activities. Just consider, for example, the example sentence here, uh, the man who answered the door was not Peter Geach. He was Elizabeth Anscombe. Elizabeth Anscombe was, of course, a woman and a student of Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, this is not clear, this is not well-formed, and that's apparent when you read this sentence. And this isn't the case for uh, semantically distant homonyms, you know, the same word that has a different meaning depending on how it is used. So bank is a homonym. It can refer to a financial institution or the side of a river. Uh, this is not clear, this is not well-formed, and that's apparent when you read this sentence. And this isn't the case for uh, semantically distant homonyms, you know, the same word that has a different meaning depending on how it is used. So bank is a homonym. It can refer to a financial institution 
or the side of a river. So uh, for a bank example, again, consider and contrast uh, the bank I went to was not near a bank with the man who discovered radium was not a man. That's also pretty unclear. The man, as in the person who discovered radium, was not a man, as in a male person. This compared the man who discovered radium was not a man to the man who discovered radium was a man, which sounds a lot more like an analytic sentence, you know, a sentence that expresses a truth of meaning. The man who discovered radium was not a man does not seem that way. Uh, and this is also why it differs from uh, the bank I went to was not near a bank. It's, it's much more ambiguous because we're using the man in the neutral sense who discovered radium was not a man in the gender specific sense. The man who discovered radium, of course, was Marie Curie, uh, who was a woman. All right. So much for the argument from clarity, let's now turn toward the argument from logic. Now consider, for example, these two sentences. Everyone is entitled to his opinion, and everyone is entitled to their opinion. Which sentence sounds correct to you? Which is a well-formed sentence? You might agree with the conservative prescriptivists that the answer is pretty obvious. The uh, former sentence is the grammatically well-formed one. Everyone is entitled to his opinion, not everyone is entitled to their opinion. Why? Because everyone is really working to refer to, you know, individuals. And individuals are his or her, not they, right? And I'll get back to this in a minute, in case you're wondering about the gender-neutral they. We're going to come back to that, so don't worry about that. But of course, Mercier disagrees with this. She thinks that different logical relations of anaphora and, uh, and binding entail the correctness of they and their in these cases, where we can use they and their in a singular sense. Now, what are anaphora? Anaphora are pronouns that are like uh, referential expressions. They're pronouns that function as referential expressions. So, for example, in this sentence, John loves his dog, the word his acts as an anaphoric pronoun. It stands in for John. Um, and it, it kind of abbreviates, it's like an abbreviated referent. Uh, to the antecedent John, right? His is an anaphoric uh, so his is an anaphoric pronoun in that it refers to John. What, a, what are binding pronouns? Binding pronouns are like logical placeholders. So in the sentence, everyone is entitled to their opinion, the word there is acting as a bound, empty variable, uh, and it has no gender or number. And you can plug that in later. Anaphoric pronouns uh, do refer back to the individuals that are named or referred to in linguistic expressions, like his dog, the his refers to John. But uh, binding pronouns, like their, in everyone is entitled to their opinion, doesn't work this way, according to Mercier. What the conservative pedants are doing here is uh, focusing in on, uh, you know, treating uh, binding pronouns as if they were anaphoric pronouns, and that's not what we should be doing here. In other words, they isn't an anaphora, it isn't plural when it's acting as a bound variable. I mean, after all, we don't say everyone are entitled to their opinion. Um, Everyone is uh, syntactically sing singular, but everyone is also semantically plural. And it's, it's a quote from page 248. It is not the surface syntactic number of the antecedent that is relevant to anaphor agreement, nor of the subject to verb agreement, but it's semantic number. So semantically, everyone is plural, even though syntactically, everyone is singular. And that's why that they or their can work as a bound variable. Uh, there's, uh, there's no, um, you know, it's a bound to empty variable, I should say. 
So, and that's why uh, Mercy disagrees that, you know, a sentence like, uh, everyone is entitled to their opinion is, in fact, a well-formed sentence. Um, and we can use they uh, in a singular way. All right, so now we come finally to the argument from justice, which is about making women visible in our linguistic practices. Now recall Frege and the ideas of sense and reference, right? The referent is that uh, entity that a word picks out, but the sense of that word is uh, it, the mode of presentation of the referent. Now, uh, meaning is, I think we can all agree, partially dependent on how things are represented, right? What mode of presentation uh, are, is something represented through? That's why there's a difference in meaning between the morning star and the evening star, or Hesperus and Phosphorus, even though these two terms have the same referent, which is the planet Venus. Similar way in which um, uh, Superman is a journalist at the Daily Planet and Clark Kent is a journalist in the Daily Planet have a different cognitive value for Lois Lane. So the way we represent something, or the mode of presentation, will influence how we think about that thing. Just to illustrate this for you, I'm going to read to you a puzzle from this paper. And if you try and make sense of this puzzle, you will probably see what I mean. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm talking about the mode of presentation of the characters in this story. How are they, how are those reference presented to us? What is the sense in which those reference are presented to us in this riddle. I'll read this riddle to you now, and I want to see, I want to hear from you in the comments uh, if you can make sense of it. So here's the riddle from page 255 of Mercier's paper. A man and his son are driving along a road when suddenly a truck hits their car. The father is killed. The son is rushed to the hospital. When the ambulance arrives, the doctor takes one look at the boy and exclaims, I can't operate on this man. He's my son. So, can you make sense of that riddle? What's going on there? It sounds almost like the man's father was killed, and then all of a sudden the man's father is this doctor. What's going on there? Well, stay tuned to find out. Mercy's claim here, in any case, and you can read this on slide 22, is that masculine language um, misrepresents the universe, or the world, by obscuring women. And basically, what she's arguing is that by eliminating the gender-neutral use of masculine language, this would help to bring women back into our uh, social linguistic reality, right? Uh, both figuratively and literally. And if you don't think that Mercier is right about this, then think back to the riddle I just gave you. Did that sound strange and weird? Could you not make sense of it? Why could you not make sense of it? Well, I'm going to tell you. So let's just read this riddle one more time. Maybe you got the riddle. Maybe you figured it out. But if you haven't, I'm going to explain it to you now. So let's go through it one more time. A man and his son are driving along the road when suddenly a truck hits their car. So we have a man and his son, two males in this car. A truck hits their car and the father is killed. Okay, so there's two men or two males. The man is killed. His son is rushed to the hospital. His son, also male. Okay, no problem. When the ambulance arrives, the doctor takes one look at the boy and exclaims, I can't operate on this man. He's my son. If you were confused by this riddle, you might have been because, hang on, his father was killed. What is this doctor saying? He's my son. Is the doctor con confused? No. The doctor is a woman. The doctor is the boy's mother. The masculine language in the riddle obscured that from you. And if you had trouble making sense of what was going on in this scenario, that's the reason why, argues Mercier, this masculine language has obscured the way the world is like for you. And of course, this is why I agree with Mercier, and why in uh, the instructions for your essay, for example, and indeed in all my classes, 
I tell my students to use inclusive language because I do think that to some extent, the language we use affects the way we see or think about reality. And if in turn, the way we think about reality affects the way we use language, well, we're at risk of uh, developing and maintaining linguistic practices that exclude people. Perhaps they exclude women. They may exclude um, other marginalized groups as well. Obviously, our linguistic practice can exclude some racialized individuals, as we saw in the colorism example from this paper. And indeed, uh, you can see from other uh, more stark examples that Mercier mentions around that section, which I haven't talked about here. Of course, you can probably also see this if you've kept your ear to the ground in regards to the recent debates that have taken place in the public sphere about the gender-neutral they. The gender-neutral they and them uh, is, is, uh, is used to refer to, uh, say, for example, non-binary individuals, you know, I didn't, I, individuals who do not identify as male or female. Uh, but I guess this would be a, about the time to offer a little bit of reflection on all of this. Uh, uh, I was going to have some reflection and discussion questions on political correctness, but I don't think I'm going to do that in any formal way. I think I'll just leave you with a couple of thoughts that I've had as I've read through this paper. So as I was reading through this paper and this debate uh, that took place in the 90s between Mercier and Dummett and Dawkins in terms of the, uh, you know, whether we should keep using the gender neutral man and gender neutral pronouns, this reminded me of a, of a much more current debate. This reminded me of a much more current debate, which you've probably heard of, and that is the debate I mentioned earlier about the use of the gender neutral they and how... Um, uh, you know, uh, somebody like uh, Jordan Peterson, who's kind of uh, been rocketed to fame on the basis of, I don't know, misunderstanding a lot of things, like discussion about the gender-neutral they, or about the details of Bill C-16 and all of that stuff. Don't, don't get me started on this. Uh, I don't want this to turn into a rant about how Jordan Peterson is wrong about a whole bunch of stuff. But this is... This is this is just to point out that this is kind of similar to another debate that's happening now. And this is why we need to pay careful attention to the language we use. Personally, I think, as you already know, we should not use the gender neutral man. We should use inclusive terms like humanity and people. I also think that there is absolutely no problem in using they to refer uh, to people in the singular sense. You know, if there's a non-binary or a trans individual who wants their pronouns to be they and them, there's no problem because they can work in this unbound, uh, you know, this bound, undetermined, variable kind of way that Mercier points out in this paper. Moreover, thinkers like Peterson that seem to have a problem with this uh, seem to miss the fact that we use the they in, in the singular sense all the time. All the way back in the English language, by the way, I mean Shakespeare does it. That is pointed out in this very paper that Mercier has written. And if it's good enough for Shakespeare, it's good enough for me. So I don't really want to say too much about political correctness other than, you know, we've seen here that Dummett claims that um, Arguments against the use of the gender-neutral man and gender-neutral male pronouns are ideologically motivated and only ideologically motivated. Uh, somebody like Peterson, I guess, makes a similar claim um, about uh, using uh, they or them for, as a first-person pronoun uh, for, uh, you know, trans and non-binary people. He claims this is all um, postmodern Marxist ideology. Postmodernism and Marxism are also two things that Peterson does not seem to really understand very well, but I digress. In any case, I think both of these thinkers are wrong. This isn't just some ideological argument motivated by politically correctness. At least it isn't for me. I think that by using the gender-neutral man, and on the, other, on the other hand, by not using the pronouns that trans or non-binary people would like us to use, 
we are doing real harm. It's not ideological. It's a matter of including people who exist and who have rights and who need to be, uh, who deserve to be treated as people into our discourse. So for me, this isn't about ideology and political correctness. It's just about doing the right thing. In any case, I suppose I better leave it there before I get too ranty with everything. But I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. This was certainly an interesting one for me, especially because it bears on a debate that is, you know, happening now, and because it's a very good illustration of how our linguistic practices shape the way we think about reality, and how the way we think about reality affects our linguistic practices. All right, so that is it for our lecture, this lecture, the final lecture. We made it, guys. This is the last lecture on anything substantive in this class. You won't be tested on any of this in any further quizzes, but you can talk about Mercier on the final exam if indeed you choose to answer one of those questions. And by the way, I have another video coming up shortly which covers the instructions for your final take-home exam. So I'll do a kind of a quick overview of those instructions and a very brief wrap-up. Well, thanks very much everyone for sticking around. Uh, again, I'm sorry that this one was a bit late. I meant to have this up for Saturday. It looks like it's going to be up for Sunday evening. So you'll be able to see this lecture and the final video on the uh, exam instructions later this evening uh, or Monday when you get up and get to work. Other than that, well, this has been fun. Um, this has been a challenging class. I'll say more about this in my next lecture, but uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up by saying that if any of you have any questions about this material or anything else about the material that's covered on the exam, don't be afraid to get in touch with me. You know, come get a hold of me via email, Discord, see you learn discussion boards, YouTube comment section. Get involved. Chat with me. We can have an office hours meeting over Discord if you want. And if you're not sure about anything, we can work that out. Also, your essays have been graded. So if you have any questions about your grades, you should speak to our teaching assistant, Will. He did the grading, and he'll be able to uh, explain uh, things, answer any questions you may have. All right, so that is all. I hope you all take care of yourselves. I hope you're all doing okay. We're almost through this semester, and I know it's been a busy one. So after you guys watch this lecture, before you write the final, you know, give yourselves a couple of days to rest, if possible. You've earned it. All right? So I'll see you next time for our final video. Bye for now, everybody.